Motion one, research into the use of cannabis. The Honourable Sophia Mormond. Thank you, President. I rise to move the motion in my name that this House notes the tabling in the Victorian Parliament of its Legal and Social Issues Committee report into the use of cannabis in Victoria and urges the McGowan government to consider undertaking similar research here in Western Australia. Members, the Honourable Member has moved that motion and the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Sophia Mormond. Thank you, President. A little less than a month ago, the Victorian Parliament's Committee on Legal and Social Issues tabled in their Legislative Council a groundbreaking report on cannab cannabis use in that state. Having stood here alongside my colleague, the Honourable Dr. Brian Walker, for some months. Uh, Honourable Member, uh, members are asking if you are able to speak a little louder so that they can hear or lean more towards the microphone. OK, sure. Thank you. So having, st having stood here uh, alongside my colleague, the Honourable Dr Brian Walker, for some months now, asking questions of government departments and coming to the conclusion, however slowly and reluctantly, that we may not have the answers readily available to us, I wonder that what we might learn from the Victorian experience and whether or not we might benefit here in Western Australia from a similar information-gathering approach. The Victorian report is built on the back of two simple but far-reaching questions. How do we keep cannabis out of the hands of young people and how do we keep cannabis out of the hands of criminals? Some of the answers our Victorian colleagues came up with may surprise you. Others might not, because much of their approach strikes me as simple common sense. Let's see as we range through their research and conclusions, however. Those can be broken into four key areas. Uh, legislative reform, mental health and other health impacts, issues with a criminal justice-based approach, cannabis and other drug education. Obviously, we don't have the time to look at all their conclusions today, but I would certainly like to take some time to share with members who might not have read the report in its entirety the key recommendations that resulted from it. Recommendation one is particularly interesting from a WA perspective. Let me read it for the benefit of members. The recommendation one states that the Victorian government investigates the impacts of legalising cannabis for adult personal use in Victoria. This should include possession of a small quantity of cannabis for people over the age of 18, the use of cannabis for people over the age of 18 in private locations, the cultivation of small number of cannabis plants per person over the age of 18 at their principal place of residence. Plants should be grown in an area that is not accessible to the public or people under the age of 18. At the risk of playing down what is being asked here, members will be aware that we had much the same regime here in WA 20 years ago. We were ahead of our time, and now Victoria is trying to catch up, while it appears that we are continuing to move backwards, or at the very least, just stay in the same position. In the mental health space, the following findings were made. The causal link between cannabis use and some mental illnesses is unclear. Some people with existing mental health issues may be drawn to cannabis use to read their symptoms uh, and in doing so, exacerbate their mental health, uh, their mental illness further. For this group, cannabis is a compounding factor rather than a cause. And the population level risk for the development of psychosis and psychotic disorders as a result of cannabis use is very low. For those members following along, those two findings are on pages 83 and 88 of the report, respectively. The second of them struck me particularly, the risk of developing psychosis and or a psychotic disorder as a, result, as a result of cannabis use is very low. And let's remember, that's not simply out um, fellow, ejected, rep, fellow elected representatives expressing a personal opinion. 
That is a finding based upon evidence taken from a range of highly qualified individuals, not least Professor Dan Lubman from Turning Point and Professor Joe Bowden from the University of Otago, both recognised experts in their field. Leading on from those findings was this one. The risk of neurological damage caused by early onset cannabis use can be mitigated by measures such as education campaigns about the danger of cannabis use for young people and legalising cannabis and prohibiting its sale to young people. Uh, in relation to that, a new paper that I came across yesterday that was published earlier this month showed there was no correlation between cannabis use uh, and neurological damage. Okay, this shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us. We know how effective campaigns around underage drinking have been in recent years. Alcohol Think, again, is a good example. The report suggests nothing new in that sense. It simply suggests that we need to be prepared to use the same tools we already have in our arsenal to tackle underage drinking, to similarly tackle underage cannabis use. The answer lies in education. It is also clear that we need to take cannabis out of the hands of criminals if we are to position ourselves to achieve any real reduction in youth uptake. Finding eight in the report is perhaps one of the most far-reaching and philosophical findings set down. The harms that arise from the criminalization of cannabis affect a larger number of people and have greater negative impact than the mental health and other harms associated with cannabis use. In other words, we are currently a part of the problem rather than a part of the solution. Our inactivity, in some cases, and our active mistrust of the research in others is hurting ordinary women and men, certainly in Victoria, and I have no doubt here in Western Australia as well. When it came to the, the criminal justice impacts of our current criminal policies, and they are criminal in my opinion, though not in the sense that some here might like to use the word, the report is equally damning. It notes that despite a reduction in the number of cannabis offences nationally in Victoria, between 2017 and 18 and 2018-19, there was an 8.4% increase and in 2018 and 19, over 94% of cannabis-related arrests in Victoria were for offences related to consumption. If there's one thing that has struck me over the past few months, and it may have struck other members as well, as they have listened to us, us, to us ask question after question of our police and justice ministers, it is the fact that we simply do not keep we, do, we cannot or will, will not share numbers around these issues here in WA. If it takes an in inquiry such as this to reveal those numbers, then for that reason alone, I would be inclined to support one. The Victorian report also threw up an interesting gender imbalance. Again, it is impossible to say whether this is the case in WA or not, but in Vo Victoria at least, both male and female offenders were more likely to receive an imprisonment sentence for possession-related offences compared to use-related offences. Over 25% of male offenders received an imprisonment sentence for cannabis possession offences between 2016 and 2019. Over 15% of female offenders received an imprisonment sentence for cannabis possession offences between uh, 2016 and 2019. Is that the case here as well? Who knows? We haven't done the work to inform ourselves, let alone our community. One finding that I suspect would almost certainly be reflected reflective across jurisdictions is the imbalance in cannabis sentences handed down to our First Nations people. Finding 12 of the report on page 141 states that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Victorians are significantly overrepresented in sentencing statistics for minus cannabis offences compared to other Victorians. From 2015 to 2020, they accounted for 6% of the 
of cannabis offenders, despite only making up 0.8% of Victoria's population. In addition, they are less likely to receive a caution, more likely to be required to attend court proceedings for the offence, and more likely to receive a punitive sentence. This may not be as shocking as it should be, uh, members, but it is certainly a sad and a sorry state of affairs, and which one, one which I suspect would be reflected in figures Australia-wide were we to dig a little deeper than we have to date. My friend and colleague, the Honourable Dr Brian Walker, will speak in a few moments to the report's findings around medicinal cannabis and the failings of the regulatory frameworks currently in place there. I shan't steal his thunder, for there's more material for me to cover here generally. A criminal re uh, finding 15, for example, which was unsurprisingly, which quite unsurprisingly notes that a criminal record for a minor cannabis use or possession offence creates barriers to housing, education and employment for individuals. These barriers are counterproductive to rehabilitation and reintegration, possibly increasing the likelihood of reoffending. Members don't need to take our Victorian colleagues' word for that, though. They can look, they can look a good deal closer to home. I will even offer a prize for the first amongst us to correctly identify the member who, speaking in the other place in 2003, stated that this government does not want those people in our community who may be small-time users once or twice or even ten times to have a criminal record. We do not want it to have an impact on young people's employment pros prospects or their capacity to travel. Um, any takers, possibly? Members opposite don't recognise the words of their own Premier then. So it's a funny world in which members of legalised cannabis WA find themselves with more in common with a Labour Premier than his own party members do. But again, that is perhaps a debate we can return to at a later date. Cost to the individual is one thing, cost to the state is quite another. And the Victor Victorian report does good work breaking that down. It finds that, the, um, that there are su substantial costs involved in policing cannabis use through the criminal justice system, including in police resources, court expenses, cost of imprisonment, community corrections, and legal aid and prosecution. And the effectiveness of this massive investment in criminalisation. The report finds that Victoria spends millions of dollars annually criminalising cannabis, but criminal organisations are still making millions of dollars cultivating and selling cannabis in Victoria. These funds are being funnelled into other criminal activity, including the manufacture of far more dangerous substances. We know that in our hearts, but we need to grasp the contact concept with our minds as well. I have absolutely no doubt we, that we are inflicting the same costs, if not higher costs, on the taxpayers of WA. But we are to prove that we need to be willing to investigate and report back here in our own state with our own data. How much might we save here in WA, or how much money might we be able to re reallocate from criminal justice budget across into health and housing, possibly, if we simply acknowledge that the war on drugs has failed. Imagine if we had a war on drug harm instead. Where might that take us? Because, as the report so aptly states, the prohibition of cannabis has had a, a limited impact on the illicit cannabis market and the use of cannabis generally. In other words, our money is being wasted, members. We've ceded control to the criminal fraternity and they're making hay while we, here sit, while we sit here wondering where we went wrong. Education is certainly going to be key. There's no doubt of that. And the Victorian report makes that clear when it recommends that the government's approach to drug education should avoid stigmatising users, promote help-seeking behaviours, engage in open and non-judgmental dialogue, dialogue with people using drugs, 
and have a greater emphasis on teaching about the risks to young people and acknowledge that the risks of drug use exist, exist on a continuum. The committee saw a clear need in this space and called for the Victorian government to uh, review the effectiveness of school-based education and whether the existing curriculum is achieving its intended outcomes. This should also consider whether the curriculum structure is suitable for a harm minimization approach to drug education as intended. And the report concludes, based once again upon the testimony of experts that school-based drug education is more effective when it is based on harm minimization approach and not abstinence-based messaging. That is finding 19 on page 203 for those who want to read around it further. Of course, all of this, by its very definition, is Victorian data. But let's not kid ourselves. Sitting over here on the other side of the country, if you took the word Victoria out and in either of those instances and substituted it with the words West, Western Australia, does anyone seriously think, think that the statement wouldn't still be at least as accurate? Indeed, if you look, took the word Victoria out of the title and the report itself and substituted almost any other state and territory instead, I think it would still prove you with a relevant starting point for a discussion on the merits of cannabis reform within a modern Australian setting. I'm very aware of the clock, President, just as I'm aware of the fact that while I've been able to cover some of the major findings and recommendations in this value report, I haven't really taken readers any further than the executive summary. Uh, there are another 250 pages of detailed analysis and study, and I have hope that I might have piqued members' interest enough that we'll read the report in its entire, entirety. We are all busy people, but this really is a worthwhile exercise. It's also worth noting that there was broad cross-party support amongst committee members in Victoria to advocate for change. Uh, yes, there are minority reports attached, but one of the two, written by the Liberal, Liberal Democrats member, actually advocates going further than the main report does, with, while the Liberals and Nationals sadly refuse to listen to the medical and social experts, preferring, preferring to parrot the police line almost ad nauseum. I hope we might see more genuine discussion and a meeting of minds if we were to undertake a similar process here in WA. If we did, the ordinary women and men in the street would be the ultimate beneficiary. The Victorian police now have a document available to them, a deep dive into cannabis use in their state that highlights the pathways to change and the need to go down those pathways with broad community support. This is a sub substantial report of which the Victorian parliament can be proud. It's a report that the Andrews government can now take on board as it considers reform. And it is an example to other states and territories, not least Western Australia, in the research that can and should be undertaken if we are to understand the place of cannabis in society today. I commend the foresight of the Victorian Parliament in commissioning this report, and I urge the House to acknowledge it and to consider if we might not usefully do something similar here in Western Australia during the lifetime of this parliament. Thank you. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I stand to make some comments with regard to this motion. Um, can I say at the outset I'm probably the least qualified, well, probably not the least qualified, but one of the unqualified, most unqualified um, members of the chamber to comment on this issue, because I've got to say, I've never had an illicit drug in my life, and that includes cannabis. So I'd be one of the few, I'm sure. Yes, I know. I know I'm St. Peter, but, um, but that's, that is fact. Uh, and that is, that is. So having said that, I did come from an era, um, uh, and I talked about this with the Arts and Culture Bill a couple of days ago with um, the, uh, a time warp of the 70s. And back in the 70s, can I say, President, cannabis, quite frankly, was a hanging offence. Everyone well, I didn't, but everyone smoked. Smoking was advertised and it was, it was very, very socially acceptable. And cannabis was a hanging offence. Now, go figure. 2021, 
Smoking is almost a hanging offence, and it will be apparently in about 10 years' time, and cannabis is, is, um, is an accepted norm. So we have, completely, we have completely moved on. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I'll refer to a, a one particular area of the, of the motion, that is with regard to drug education. It is imperative, and I thank the honourable members for bringing, uh, for bringing this motion to the chamber. Um, my concern with um, cannabis is that it not be deemed as an entrance drug, and that is that it not be deemed as a, a soft option, particularly for young people, and then to move on to higher order drugs, illicit drugs. And um, that is, still remains my concern. And unless we have comprehensive um, education policies throughout our schools, that's still my fear. That is captured in the report. That is captured in one of the recommendations. Because all you need to do is to go and speak to police or go and speak to uh, first responders every single day, particularly on the weekends around some of the clubs, nightclubs, etc., and see the, the hideous impacts of drug use on particularly young people in our community. So we've got to do whatever we can to prevent uh, the use of uh, higher order illicit drugs uh, in our community. And that's why school drug education is absolutely imperative. Because unfortunately, we're li living in a meth world now, President. And if I could just um, uh, provide some statistics with regard to this. Um, that have been provided to the Estimates Committee. In 2017, there were 84 tonnes of meth, amphetamine, um, kilos uh, came into Western Australia. 2018, 188. 2019, 454 uh, tonnes of meth coming into Western Australia. It uh, plummeted in 2020, where it had 122 tonnes when we had the closed borders. And then, unfortunately, it now skyrocketed again up until uh, August of 2021. 365 tonnes so far this, uh, this um, year. So that is having an enormous negative impact on the lives of hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of Western Australians. Now, my aim, as I said, is not to pass judgment on cannabis, and I'm, I've definitely softened in that respect, and particularly with regard to, um, to the criminalisation of cannabis. Right? But I have not softened in terms of my attitude towards the imperative component of school drug education and the implications of cannabis use with um, students. Harm, minimisi harm minimisation. I don't have a problem with that. And I've got some experience with regard, regard to that. So with regard to the Victorian, um, the Victorian report, if you turn to recommendation 15, it says uh, that the Victorian government reviews the effectiveness of school-based uh, drug education and whether the existing curriculum is achieving its intended outcomes. This should also consider whether the curriculum structure is suitable for a harm minimisation approach to drug education as intended. The review should examine if teachers and schools are receiving appropriate training and resources to deliver drug education to students, if it is being taught in the most appropriate subject areas, its effectiveness on young people's understanding on the risks of cannabis and drug use, and what impact it has on delaying the onset of cannabis use by young people. And I thought that sounds very, very familiar. Very familiar. And I know why it sounds very familiar, because I was part of the National School Drug Education Committee back in the 1990s. And we released, the, we released a report, the National School Drug Education Strategy, in May of 1999. The goal, the goal of the National School Drug Education Strategy is no illicit drugs in schools. The National School Drug Education Strategy strengthens the provision of educational programs and supportive environments which contribute to the goal of no illicit drugs in schools. The goal is based on the belief that illicit and other unsanctioned drug use in schools is unacceptable. The focus will be on educational outcomes, assisting students with drug-related uh, uh, problems and deterring the presence and use of unsanctioned drugs in schools will also be addressed. And then it goes down to 15 principles. And those 15 principles contain each one of the principles contained in the Victorian um, recommendations. Drug education is best taught in the context of school health curriculum. Drug education programs and resources should be selected to complement the role of the classroom teacher with selected external resources enhancing and not replacing that role. Objectives for, school drug for drug education in schools should be linked with the overall goal of harm minimisation. So you could just say ditto. So essentially what we've got is the recommendations from the committee that I sat on are replicated in this uh, re uh, Victorian report. So I, and I stand by that. Uh, we, we had, that was a tremendous committee, I've got to say. I sat on it for about four or five years. We did an enormous amount of research on the harm of illicit drugs on young people in particular, but also on the fact that the punitive, the punitive way 
in terms of, uh, of sanctions against, against young people is inevitably going to end in tears. And it will. You know, it's got to be, it's got to be comprehensive, effective drug education, harm minimisation, an understanding of um, uh, what drugs, illicit drugs can do to your, particularly high order illicit drugs, can do uh, not just to your body, but to your mind, uh, to your life. And so, um, as I said, the fact that, that that report was handed down in May um, 1999, and here we are 22 years um, later, basically saying the same things, uh, is interesting. Now, we do have a program here in Western Australia, the Sidira program. Um, little sporadic, but it's there. Ideally, we can still do more. Now, uh, uh, from my perspective, I, I can just finish on this, President, and this just adds a little weight to it. And I've mentioned this story before, but I'll tell it again uh, in terms of the punitive versus probably the educative role. When I was a teacher at Scotch College, I also was a, a house head, which is a pastoral role. Now, we used to have our, pa our, our house meetings on a Monday. And after one of those meetings, a year eight boy brought up a wallet to me. He said, sir, someone's left this wallet. So I went back to my office, opened up the wallet, saw who it was, and there's a little satchel of cannabis in the wallet. Right? Now, I, saw, I knew this boy well. <laughs> so anyway, about five minutes later, this year 12 boy rushed into my office. Sir, sir, I left my wallet. I said, yes, I'll call him Max. It's not his name. I said, yeah, Max, here it is, mate. So I gave him the wallet. Right. He was so worried. He turned around and walked off. And I said to him, hey, Max. And he said, turned around, yes, sir. I said, if it happens again, mate, it's not just the two of us that are going to know about this. He said, oh, thanks, sir, and walked out. Anyway, he's a wonderful young man. He really was. A bit of a likeable rogue, but a, just a great young man, right? From a very you know, well-to-do family in Delkeith. And anyway, about three years later, he'd finished school, and I, at that stage, was in Parliament. I got a Chelsea pizza, and I ordered the pizza, got delivered, opened up the door, here's Max, right, with my pizza. And um, anyway, I said, Max, how are you going, mate? And he said, oh, great. And he, was he was at the surf club, and he was doing engineering at UWA. Anyway, we had a bit of a chat and caught up, and it was a really poignant moment. We just stood there, and he turned around, and he walked, and then he stopped. And then he turned back, and because he, he kept on calling me sir. I said, you can call me Peter now, actually. Anyway, he turned around, and he said, thanks, sir. And it was really good, because he understood. And for those of you that perhaps um, haven't been in a classroom, haven't been in school, and understand the social stigma of being, having a, a drug um, offence against you, it is profound. And particularly from somewhere there in the western suburbs, he, it more than likely would have been suspended from the school for a week, at least a week or two, and he would have gone through then with that stigma on him. I'm not doing it to, to sound like Gandhi. I'm doing it just to say the punitive aspect of, um, of um, a reaction to drug use is something that we need to consider, particularly in education. In education, it is absolutely imperative that we provide all of our students from all of the regions, every culture, you know, uh, every uh, the, the genders right across the board, an understanding of what drugs are, their implications, and then ask people to make their minds up. If we do that, we do have comprehensive drug education uh, and uh, adhere to that policy of harm minimisation. I think we can go a long way to uh, uh, alleviating the scourge of higher order drug use. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Brian Walker. Uh, thank you, President. And uh, thank you also, uh, Honourable Peter Collier, for that uh, very, uh, uh, very illuminating uh, explanation. Um, I've only got uh, 10 minutes. I had planned for more, actually, so I'll have to greatly um, uh, modify my speech. The first thing I'd like to do is with, uh, ask leave to table this, um, the, the, uh, the actual report. Sorry. The Honourable Member is seeking leave to take, table the report referred to in the motion. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. 
Thank you, President, and thank you, Members, because the report really is a fascinating report. It's a wonderful report. Uh, it's not, it doesn't really do much more than look at the, uh, uh, the issues surrounding personal use of cannabis. We as a party, we're actually much more interested in cannabis as a plant, a whole plant, of which personal use is but one. Uh, and I could speak all day about this. Uh, there's, there's a couple of things I do want to mention here leading on from this with my rather curtailed time. The cannabis with the health aspect, I think, is pretty much a no-brainer. Uh, as a medical practitioner, my first uh, concern is to ensure wellness. And that also in involves the issue of minimising damage, minimising the harm because there's no one who will be uh, uh, maintaining the point of view that cannabis is benign. It's a, it's a safe drug as far as drugs go. It's far safer than alcohol, certainly safer than tobacco, but it is not a benign drug, and it's certainly there are concerns which can be raised. And what I particularly liked about this report was the way in which it addressed the issues surrounding the potential for harm. And two things come out of that, uh, and basically the first is that the amount of harm we perceive can be caused is less than we fear. And the other aspect is that we minimise the extent of harm that can be caused by undertaking um, uh, 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 methods such as the, the uh, education within the schools to educate about drugs. Because one thing we absolutely know with certainty is that cannabis given into the hands of criminals is a great way of causing harm. A multitude of potential harms can be caused. And if we maintain the status quo we have now, then we, that's you and I, are going to be involved in maintaining a situation where harm is perpetuated. And that, I think, is unacceptable. So we need to take this to notice and assess this report in its uh, entirety and ask the question, should we in Western Australia undertake something similar because we need to find out for ourselves exactly what we need to be doing because continuing on the path of causing harm is not something that we as legislators ought to be proud of doing. Now, we found there, uh, again, things like the early onset of use and heavy use of uh, THC-dominant uh, forms of cannabis in young brains, developing brains, absolutely is not a good idea. And so we ought to take measures which protect the youngest, the weakest, uh, the, the most vulnerable amongst us. And this is something that we, as, as a body, ought to be looking at more uh, seriously. Now, we've also got the caution here. I mean, si Professor Simon Lenton, I was fascinated to read this. Uh, that yes, the harm minimization, but he cautioned. We need to take uh, cautious steps. We need to have informed steps forward. Because if we're not careful, we can go down the path of big uh, uh, tobacco and big alcohol, who, who's actually they have the same intent as the criminal organizations they want to increase their profits and to do that they want to sell as much as possible to make their profits and they don't really care about wellness what they care about is shareholder value and how much money they can bank themselves now i take a particularly uh, 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 disgruntled view of that approach it's affecting, when I see that among my patients, I see the harm that is caused. I think this, this is intolerable as well. We ought to stop that. So the, 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 the concept that we could then just give a, a free slather and allow big companies to, to put out uh, cannabis in all its forms uh, for their personal monetary gratification is not something we should allow. So we need to regulate, do we not? We need to regulate to ensure that what we are doing is healthy for our population in every which way. Now, what I did want to spend some more time on just now, because the time was limited, I could talk for hours on this and, and bore you all into submission. Uh, but the, what I really wanted to speak about here is the driving laws and cannabis, because that is something which I think has a lot of, uh, of concern in the cannabis-using population. And by cannabis-using population, I refer specifically to my patients who have been prescribed cannabis and have been told by the police officers that they are now criminals. Now, I can't think of any reason why that should be accepted. Now, we heard that... The, oh, when the cannabis... My, my patients using cannabis, when they are found by the police to have THC in their system, are now declared to be criminals because they have driven with an illicit substance in their system. 
And the Victoria Police, uh, they, they had their own concerns, and I can see where their concerns come. If we give... Example. I mean, it's not illegal to drink alcohol, but it's illegal to drive with alcohol. So why, why is that inconsistent? Uh, it's an excellent question, and thank you for asking that. And the answer is because we haven't actually quantified how much is safe. At the moment, we have a 0 0.05 limit for alcohol. Agreed. Now, I know people who on 0 0.02 ought not to be driving, but more particularly, if you have 0 0.02 and you're, you're, the, the police find that, they don't ask if you're taking an antihistamine together with alcohol, which absolutely makes you incapable of driving, because uh, safely driving, because you would be clinically impaired. But the police are not actually testing for impairment, they're testing for the presence of 0 0.05 of alcohol and beyond. When it comes to THC, what they are testing for is the presence of THC full stop. And by doing so, they are then comparing that and saying, this is uh, equivalent to being impaired. The presence of THC alone in your system is now defined to be a measure of impairment. And therefore, your licence is taken off you. Therefore, you appear in front of the magistrate. Therefore, you are possibly given a criminal conviction. And therefore, you carry that for the rest of your life. And the question I have is, do we want to tolerate that? Is this a suitable approach for managing cannabis in the population? What about, what is the actual safe level of THC we could look at? And this is what they go into here. And we understand, if you read the report there, there's so many uh, pieces of information there which relate directly to this, the safety uh, the, when driving. Now, it has been reported in some jurisdictions that if you then legalise cannabis and people are then taking cannabis as a recreational drug, do accidents increase? That's a very sensible, wise question to ask, and it's really important that we get this clear. And in some jurisdictions, they do report an increase. In Washington, uh, uh, in the US, for example. In other jurisdictions, however, we have conflicting reports, either no increase or, indeed, a decrease in drug-related crashes and injuries and deaths. And this is really vitally important to understand. What actually is the limit? Norway, for example, and this again is in the report, Norway has an approach there which allows us to, to measure the impairment. And there's a level that you can check. We could discuss the levels, but that, of course, is something entirely different. That's a, for another discussion down the road, perhaps after our own committee, if we are granted one, is given permission to report. Now, uh, page uh, uh, 174, um, this one goes directly into it. Numerous stakeholders, I quote here, believe that the current approach to cannabis-impaired driving is inappropriate because it does not consider the level of impairment. They argued that a detection-based test was not sufficient considering that THC can be present in a driver's system for long periods of time, even after impairment has diminished. Now, that, mem that um, people that have been prescribed it, they can't use that as a defence, that in the courts it's not... Can they raise the fact that they have had a prescription f uh, to constitute a defence? Indeed, that is so. There's a quote here. Um, it, there's a list of comparable jurisdictions in that regard. And um, this is Table 4.8 on page 176. United Kingdom, medical defence. Norway, there's a medical defence. Germany, there's a medical defence. Ireland, there's a medical defence. New Zealand, there's a medical defence. But in, in Australia, and in, in Western Australia in particular, I'm concerned about WA, there is no defence using the medical conditions. So practically what happens is that our police force is now required by our laws to declare a person with the presence of THC, whatever the level, whatever the time, to be impaired. So actually what we're saying to our police force is we are empowering you to become professional liars. And this is intolerable as well. We need to make a change. We have to make a change. Uh, the, the report goes on to note, ah, in Tasmania, the only jurisdiction... Order, order. Member, your time your, for your contribution has expired. The question is, the motion be agreed. 
The Minister for Regional Development. Thank you. Um, uh, look, uh, can I thank the Honourable Sophie, Sophie uh, Momon for bringing uh, this motion forward? And uh, I think uh, that body of work uh, that has been undertaken by the Victorian Parliament is a uh, will be, uh, I think, a very interesting read, and uh, I'm sure all of us um, on this side of the house, because certainly our government's policy is one of harm minimisation, uh, that we will be um, extremely interested, I think, in um, in reading uh, in reading that report, and we um, uh, clearly understand uh, that our our friends from uh, the Legalised Cannabis Party um, clearly have a, have a, a mandate to, uh, to be pressing for these issues. Uh, and uh, I think it's an important part of, uh, of an ongoing debate um, within, our, uh, within our community. Um, there has been some reference to uh, comments that have been made by the Premier. We're all very uh, well aware of uh, the comments that are made by our. Um, uh, di Sorry? Um, that have. No, she was mentioned in this one. Um, uh, my, my colleague here is telling me it's a different part of the motion, but uh, I, uh, the matter was raised uh, by the Honourable Sophia Mamon. But obviously, while my colleague was out on urgent, um, <laughs> urgent parliamentary business, and he, he missed that gem. But uh, uh, um, uh, uh, so um, uh, I'm, uh, it is important that. Uh, uh, that uh, we uh, get that uh, record clear, and I think uh, the uh, uh, the premier uh, at the time was uh, a premier a member for Rockingham at, at that time certainly was very much focusing on uh, the need to um, protect uh, young people um, from um, uh, being caught up in the criminal uh, criminal justice system, and uh, we do note that um, certainly the reform bill that was introduced by Labor at that time include provisions included provisions um, that uh, did uh, do that, um, and even in the um, Barnett government's repeal, there were elements. Uh, that were um, uh, were preserved, and and those elements that were preserved uh, involved the um, uh, the cannabis intervention um, uh, requirement scheme that g gave um, juveniles multiple opportunities and adults one opportunity to. Uh, uh, not be brought into the uh, criminal justice system if they were found with um, very low quantities of, uh, of cannabis. Now, um, uh, we do absolutely support uh, the notion of, uh, of harm minimisation, um, and uh, I think, uh, but we certainly uh, have no plans. We did not go to the election with uh, a program uh, around this, and at this particular point in time, uh, we have uh, no plans to uh, take um, uh, the steps forward that I know our friends who've moved the motion and spoken to the motion would like. Um, but I think we're always interested in having a look at the evidence uh, that has, um, has emerged. Uh, I do note um, the member has raised a, an interesting issue uh, of, because uh, the Premier, as you will know, was, has been a very, very strong and early supporter of uh, uh, making medicinal cannabis available, and indeed I think he was probably the first party leader in Australia uh, to come out and uh, strongly advocate uh, for uh, the legalisation of, uh, of medicinal uh, cannabis, and he stayed true to that form. I think um, the Honourable Brian Walker has, has raised an issue which I'm certainly uh, happy to uh, take uh, back to the attorney. Uh, and, uh, and for comment uh, that, um, that we may have people that have 
uh, quantities of THC as a result of uh, their perfectly legal uh, activity uh, and that there needs to be some assessment of uh, whether or not that level of THC actually uh, does constitute a, an impairment. And I think the, uh, the propositions that you have put forward here is um, to allow a, a medical defence. Now, I'll, I'll certainly be uh, seeking um, uh, some comment um, on that point. Uh, the Honourable um, uh, Peter Collier assures us that he is a man of uh, of uh, very few vices, or, or certainly not of the um, uh, of the type that the majority of the population has engaged in. He keeps his vices within the clan, um, and uh, I'm sure that's reassuring for the uh, population to know uh, the level of virtue of the Honourable uh, Peter Collier. Um, I certainly can't um, make the same claims that he has made, uh, but I... <laughs> and with that, I would be more typical of the population, I'd have to say. Uh, and uh, I think that's a useful thing to be in, uh, in Parliament. Um, uh, the, uh, but I do agree with the Honourable uh, Peter Collier that, uh, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that uh, the community is awash with meth and uh, that one could never underestimate the amount of, of damage uh, that uh, this widespread availability and wide use of meth is doing um, in our community, the degree to which that uh, underpins so much of the uh, domestic violence uh, that, we, uh, that we see, the, um, the long-term and uh, often seemingly irreversible damage that is uh, occurring to uh, uh, to uh, big users of uh, of meth and, and the ease with which um, the um, meth uh, is able to, uh, I, I guess, capture capture individuals. This is extremely alarming, and we need to make sure. And the Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, talked about drug education, and I think it is very important, but that drug education has to be realistic. It has to be based on um, uh, really understanding um, what uh, is going on in the community and what sort of experiences young people will have. And I must say that uh, that ABC program uh, had... Um, uh, who do you? Uh, you can't ask that. There was a series. There was uh, an episode that dealt with uh, uh, methamphetamine uh, use, and it was these incredibly honest accounts of people um, who had been in, and some who were still in the uh, in the grip of uh, methamphetamine. And I think it's important to understand what people's experiences are, because if you have an education program uh, that doesn't, uh, that is discordant with the reality uh, that the young people that you're educating uh, is discordant with the reality, their experience of things, that drug education program is not going to, uh, not going to work. So we need, this is something that requires a great deal of, uh, of sophistication in how you do uh, proper drug education. And uh, um, a simple just say no um, uh, approach is not going to be one uh, that will resonate. It will resonate with a, a certain percentage of the population, but we need to, we need to make kids uh, resilient. We need to make them resilient so that if they do have a drug experience and they like it, they understand that uh, what the pathway uh, might look like um, going forward. And if we're not honest about uh, what that initial experience may, um, may feel like, then our educational message is going to be lost. Uh, and I think it is incredibly important um, uh, to get uh, ex-meth users um, very much involved in those uh, 
in those education programs because they are the ones that can tell the powerful story uh, about uh, how this um, product uh, can take you in and, uh, and uh, destroy it. As I said, the, the Premier um, did certainly go out on a limb on medical cannabis. We have uh, got that um, legislation in place. I think um, I understand that this is a work in, uh, in progress. I'm pleased to see and something that I've been keen to see that we have, uh, that we have also access to uh, low-dose cannabinol. Now, we've made a certain amount of progress. We've got it from... Uh, schedule four to schedule three on the poisons list. I, I still think that we've probably got uh, the, there would be some arguments there for um, uh, some opening up even within schedule three of allowing a, a, more, um, a, a more worthwhile uh, dose and, uh, and perhaps being less restrictive on the range of, uh, of uh, products that can be sold by a, um, by a pharmacist. But I do see progress um, is made. I think the Victorian report will be very interesting. I'm sure uh, many of us, um, uh, and certainly many of our health professionals, will be uh, uh, very interested in uh, reading it. It's uh, not something that is um, in the many, many issues that uh, we are dealing with in our, uh, in our government. It's certainly uh, not part of, uh, of our agenda, but I am certainly um, are prepared to take to the Attorney General, uh, I think this important issue that the member has raised uh, around the possibility of a medical defence uh, in this issue, um, uh, the issue of uh, where a person is has been prescribed THC to get something that is uh, uh, an appropriate. Uh, way of uh, of dealing with that conundrum. So, mem uh, members, thank you for the uh, for the contribution, and um, uh, yeah, we'll keep forward with the debate and discussion in our community as we go forward. Members, the question is: the motion be agreed? The honourable Colin de Grasse. Thank you, uh, President. I was uh, waiting for others to stand, but um, look, I just want to talk briefly. On this motion, and I think it is—it's uh, a good motion. These are good debates uh, to to have here, and the report from Victoria, I'm sure, um, is—I know it is quite lengthy, uh, and haven't had the opportunity to read the whole thing. But I do think the debate we have around um, around illicit drug use uh, and mechanisms to reduce the harm caused by the use of illicit drugs is important. Uh, I'm sure members who were here. In the last parliament, we'll remember, in fact, the Honourable Samantha Rowe, who's out of the Chamber on Urgent Parliamentary Business, and I are the only surviving members of the, uh, of the Select Committee, which looked into uh, alternative approaches to reducing illicit drug use and its effects in the community. And it was a very interesting committee to be a part of. Uh, I certainly went into that committee with my eyes wide open in terms of um, wanting to just see exactly what, uh, what other jurisdictions did in terms of their management of uh, illicit drugs uh, and, and the harms associated with those. There are some very interesting findings and recommendations in that report. I wholeheartedly recommend, recommend it to, to, uh, to everyone to read. We did do, uh, obviously, looked at cannabis as well as a part of uh, our investigations in that report. And what was interesting, I think, um, in particular was the, the effect that criminalisation has on, uh, on people who get then caught up in that justice system as a result of having a criminal record and the negative consequences that has on, the, on their lives, effectively, uh, and, the, um, and the, uh, you know, the resultant um, problems that creates for them further on down the track. So, those sort of debates are interesting and, and looking at how other nations, other jurisdictions deal with um, not just cannabis but other, other drugs as well uh, and what they've, what they've found in terms of uh, you know, whether you should treat um, uh, the use of a, an amount of, whatever that happens to be, of, of, of drugs as a health issue rather than a criminal issue and, and what the outcome is for community in that, 
in that respect is quite interesting. And obviously, a part of that, uh, as the Honourable Peter Collier talked about, is, is absolutely about education. Uh, the minister just said uh, in, her, uh, in her response then about educating and making sure that, e that that education is realistic. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, as, a, as a dad uh, to five daughters, I'm quite happy to have that conversation very frankly and openly with my kids about uh, what it is they're, they're probably going to be exposed to, so that they are aware um, they are aware of all the different impacts. And you've got to be realistic about it. No sugarcoating, no hiding the, um, what can and can happen and, and what may not happen. But I think um, that, uh, in a more general sense, that, that that sort of education is a very important part of the whole process and, uh, and certainly encourage more, um, more, more funding, more, uh, more, uh, more uh, use of it, or I guess more, uh, a bit more programs within our, our school system uh, that are open and, uh, and honest about what illicit drugs may do and, uh, and you know, what the harms can be to our kids with the aim to, uh, to, to make them more fully informed, I guess, about the decisions they're going to make. And, you know, let's face it, this is the society we live in. There is uh, every chance that our kids are going to be exposed to these sorts of things, and uh, we're better off having the conversation early on uh, and trying to be in the preventative phase rather than in responding after uh, they've taken a pill that's, you know, and, and landed them in hospital. I think it's really important that we have those conversations. Uh, other things that the committee did look into uh, in its travels were the various approaches by different jurisdictions, as I said before, and from right from the uh, prohibitionist approach, I guess, of countries like Sweden through to uh, the more open decriminalisation stance of countries like Portugal. And it's very interesting looking at the, the differences in, the, in those approaches and what it means in those countries. Um, as usual, I think the balance is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, but in, in some essence, decriminalisation probably is something to be considered in, in certain circumstances and, and for certain substances. You, you certainly wouldn't take that approach with substances like methamphetamine because we know uh, that the real harms that that can cause, uh, not just to the person, but to, to people around them as well. The other interesting thing um, that Sweden had, uh, even though they take the prohibitionist approach, was in... Uh, Stockholm, they actually had a, had a dedicated drug and alcohol emergency department. And I thought that was a really good idea because what that actually did was provide the, uh, the most important and necessary services for, the, for those people who had uh, been caught up in alcohol and, and drug abuse or, uh, and drug issues. They got the services they need at that place. But the other aspect of that, of course, is it takes those people out of the traditional emergency departments. And we all know, um, we all know the pressures our health system's under at the moment. We also know that as a part of that, uh, that, that drug use and alcohol issues are, a, uh, are taking a considerable resource out of that emergency department. So perhaps that's something that, uh, that we should also consider. Uh, as, a, as a way to, to take that pressure off our, off our EDs, have a dedicated service that can take those patients directly and then provide them with the necessary um, wraparound services that they're going to need in order to, in order to recover from, uh, from the problems that they're, and the challenges they're facing. Uh, of course, alcohol um, is one of those very difficult drugs to get off. Um, something else that the committee did, did find, and I, and I have to admit I found it very surprising, was that alcohol is actually one of the hardest um, drugs to come off and actually very, very dangerous for the patient. And I found that absolutely uh, fascinating, and yet that's obviously legal. So uh, it, was, uh, it was really um, confronting, actually, talking to the, uh, some of the people that were going through uh, recovery from alcohol dependence and how hard that was um, by comparison to some of the other substances that people were uh, were recovering from, and I think that was it was very eye opening that uh, that actually that that actually that recovery from alcohol uh, excessive alcohol consumption is really really challenging. So, in essence, I think um, I think the whole 
uh, idea that we, we look at uh, ways to effectively minimise the harms caused by uh, illicit substances to our, our society. Obviously, that's going to have a benefit for, for society as a whole. There are a whole host of different approaches. The report from the Select Committee does outline a number of different approaches, as I said, from various jurisdictions, from decriminalisation to prohibition, uh, and even some little ideas like that alcohol and, and other drug emergency department that could be pulled out um, are, are worthy of consideration. Uh, I think. Um, you know, uh, as I said before, that, that education is obviously a big part of that. I've seen the work done in, uh, in many of our regional communities on, on, uh, by SIDERA. I wholeheartedly support that, uh, that entity. The, the work they do is really important for our kids uh, in making sure that they are informed about um, what the choices they make. Um, but again, agree with the Minister that, uh, that, that, uh, that any education needs to be realistic. We need to make sure that kids understand uh, exactly what it is that, uh, that they may face if they choose a certain pathway. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, leave my comments. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Wilson Tucker. Thank you, President. I rise today to support this sensible motion and offer a few brief remarks on the topic of cannabis reform. I believe this motion represents an opportunity for the McGowan government to take a more progressive stance on the issue of recreational use of cannabis in Western Australia. I'm typically a data-driven person. I like to see the evidence. And I would normally take this opportunity to talk about the health benefits and some of the studies done in other jurisdictions and countries around the world where recreational cannabis is legalised. As support for this motion, However, I think this argument is best left, left to my honourable cannabis colleagues. However, I will quickly touch on my personal experience of having lived in Washington State, where recreational use of cannabis was legalised. Now, I certainly won't admit to cannabis use in Western Australia and test the limits of parliamentary privilege, but I can go one step further than the honourable Peter Collier and admit to recreational use personally of cannabis in Washington. Yes, correct. <laughs> correct, Minister. Yeah, Absolutely. I just want to emphasize that Is there, a, is there that other point. Part, places, perhaps, where you might have also? I, I, I'm not here to speculate. <laughs> I, I wouldn't classify my use in, in Washington as antisocial or debilitating in any way. In Washington, it is considered socially acceptable and has been pointed out previously, and I'm sure there's a body of work to support this, is less addictive and damaging than, than alcohol, which is legal. So without going further into my, my usage of cannabis, I firmly believe it is just a matter of when, not if, cannabis will be legalised recreationally in Australia and WA. And I believe there is an opportunity here for WA to really start shaking off the, the wait a while and nanny state mantra and take a more progressive stance and positive steps uh, forward along the road of Drug Act reform. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Brad Pettit. Thank you, President. I also rise to speak in support of the motion that the Honourable Sophia Mormond has, has moved. Um, I particularly want to thank her for tabling this report because I think it is a, um, very timely. Um, what I especially appreciated about it, I, I think reports like this offer to us some very strong evidence around why why business as usual, the things we, we've, we, we do here are actually not, not, best, uh, not, not the best options and there actually are far better options before us. And um, what was interesting about looking through the terms of reference to this report, it's actually on page nine if anyone wants, wants to see, it's actually quite conservative. I mean, the terms of reference are actually around, very clearly around harm minimisation, um, making sure young people were looked after and actually coming at it, I think, with quite a careful, cautious lens. But what was really, really interesting about the report is that after the, it's, it's a, as, as you can see by the table of document, it's a very thorough report looking at lots of evidence from all around the world. Its conclusions um, were actually, actually quite progressive 
and actually talking about very we actually need that what we're currently doing is not working and we need to shift and i i think this is actually the approach that i always appreciate being taken and one one that i hope we will take on many issues in this parliament is getting the best evidence before us and making decisions based on that that, that evidence and it's pretty clear around around that that the kind of reforms that do need to happen in this space around harm minimisation, around health, around the health impacts and the like. Um, of course, I, I can't also not rise and speak and actually make the point that much of what this report, in fact, the overwhelming majority of what this report is consistent with, I think, what the Greens policy has been in this space for a long time, um, which, of course, is good, and I, because I often do make the point that the, that our policies are based around actually making sure it's based around the best evidence. But I do want to um, thank the, the Honourable Sophia Mormon for, for bringing, this, bringing this report um, and bringing it with the evidence into this parliament. And I do hope on the back of that that we can see changes in this state that actually, uh, as the Honourable uh, uh, Wilson Tucker said, I mean, we don't wait a while on this, we actually get in front of it because I think there are real benefits around reducing harm and improving quality of life in our community. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Sophia Mormont uh, in reply. Thank you, President. So I'd like to thank all the honourable members here for their contributions to this debate. Um, in particular, the acknowledgement by the Honourable Elena McTiernan for recognising the unfairness mm. of THC presence versus impairment in medical use. Uh, I've received quite a few emails of people not being able to continue with their FIFO work because they are using medicinal cannabis and therefore would fail any drug testing on site. Another aspect of that is that those people who used to use cannabis recreationally and then uh, because it takes such a long time for it to come out of their system, have gone to harder drugs like methamphetamine to be able to maintain their FIFO work. So uh, methamphetamine takes about 48 hours to clear, where it is, uh, with cannabis THC, it can take four to six weeks and sometimes longer, depending on the person. So another thing that was noted with um, cannabis in the illegal market is that uh, some people were, some dealers were adding methamphetamine to the cannabis that they were selling. Now, cannabis is not addictive, uh, and adding something that is addictive makes sense from a business plan if you are a dealer. So by regulating the growing and the selling, you are reducing the uh, criminal activity that's associated with cannabis use. Uh, the Netherlands have recently started a, 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 a trial in regards to giving out licenses to grow cannabis. What they had there, um, one of my cousins in, the Amsterdam, in Amsterdam actually uh, rents out um, entertainment venues and cafes and restaurants in his all over the legislation there. And he was talking about the fact that uh, a coffee shop in Amsterdam can only have 500 grams of uh, cannabis material to sell. They can't grow it, so they didn't uh, get rid of the criminal element in that industry. So now they're starting to, they're doing a trial getting uh, coffee shops and coffee shop chains to grow their own cannabis to cut out that criminal element further. Um, when you cut out that criminal element as well, you can safeguard younger people. You have dedicated places to, to sell it. People need ID to be able to access it, and they can't uh, buy it from a local dealer around the corner. So you are safeguarding that under 18s uh, group. Uh, the other thing very important is education and safeguarding. One of the things that you see in younger people who are experimenting with cannabis is a lack of understanding of uh, dose, but also combi combining it with alcohol. 
They don't know their own bodies. They don't know their own limits either. And it is when they combine it with alcohol that they end up being very sick and uh, presenting to uh, emergency departments. Um, let me see, sorry. The other interesting uh, fact to note around uh, mind-altering substances is that it has been shown that people with a higher IQ are much more likely to explore their consciousness uh, than those who don't. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members, and uh, the honourable members' reply <coughs> excuse me, closes uh, the debate on that motion, and the motion lapses.